Pursuing God, today on Coffee with Conrad. Winning! I need my coffee today. It's one of those days. Anyway, I was listening to a sermon at church recently. And as I was listening, Rick was talking about how it's our personal responsibility to study the Bible. You know, while I'm sitting there in the congregation, I'm listening, and all sorts of stuff's going on in my head, you know, and in my spirit. And uh, so I'm digesting what he's saying. And the Bible represents truth. That was stated. That's one of the things he was talking about. And we must take it upon ourselves to pick up the shovel and to dig deeper into the truth. And as I'm thinking slash praying this whole time, thinking about how Paul was killing Christians using the Bible to do so, he sincerely had a zeal for God. Uh, And then he meets Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Now, Paul had a zeal for God. Remember this scripture in Romans 10? Uh, Brethren, my heart's desire and my supplication to God is for them, he's talking about the Jews, that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. Imagine Paul saying that. But if you look at his life, you can say, hey, he held the scripts. He had the Torah. He had the, the scrolls. He held the truth. And he didn't know it. You know, they he didn't know it, not according to knowledge, right? For being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. So we find ourselves that people have a zeal, so much zeal for God, that they kill Christians with that zeal. Think about it. Muslims are going around killing Christians now because they are Christians. Back then, the Jews were killing Christians because they were Christians. Isn't it interesting that in both cases, they thought they were doing God a service, right? In John 16, 2, Jesus prophesies, They shall put you out of the synagogues. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think he does God a service. That's what Paul was doing before he was Paul. He was Saul. So let this simmer a while. These people believed that they were doing right in the eyes of God. They didn't have a relationship, though, right? I'm always talking about relationship. Saul eventually meets Jesus and goes, Oh, we've got to follow the Spirit. They did not have a spiritual relationship. And I was talking about this scripture that I'm about to read yesterday on another post, but it's amazing how God works. In John 5, 36 through 40, Jesus says, But I have greater witness than that of John, for the works which the Father has given me to finish. Okay, notice that we're supposed to finish the work that God gives us. The same works that I do bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. And the Father himself which has sent me hath borne witness of me. Now he's talking to the Pharisees here. They're wanting to kill him probably for the breaking the Sabbath according to their interpretation. But he says to them, you have neither you have neither heard his voice at any time, this is John five thirty seven, nor seen his shape. Think about how Saul was on the road to Damascus. He hears the voice of the Lord. In John five thirty eight, and you have not his word abiding in you. Imagine that. What were they thinking? They studied the Torah all the time, right? Uh five thirty eight, you have not his word abiding in you, for whom he hath sent him you believe not. Let this scripture sink in. Search the scriptures, for in them you shall have, you think you have eternal life. And they are the scriptures which testify of me. I'm paraphrasing a little bit. And you will not come to me that you might have life. Now notice how Jesus sums this up in perfect fashion, as he always does. He said they didn't have the word of God in them. Now, think about that. 
He's talking to Pharisees, people that had the Word of God. <laughs> I mean, they had the scrolls. They, they knew it. They memorized large portions. And Jesus says, you do not have the Word abiding in you. Now, they were seeking to kill Jesus because he healed someone on the Sabbath. So they had the letter of the law, and they were banging it over the head of the author that wrote it. We know from Hebrews 12, too, that Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. So let's think a little bit. If they're wanting to use Scripture to kill Jesus, what kind of tree, if you're looking at the fruit of that, what kind of tree does that represent? Does that represent the tree of a loving God or the tree of sinful flesh or the tree of maybe a tear in the field or the tree of maybe Satan? How many times have people beaten you over the head with Scripture? Oh, you got to stop doing that sin. Da, da, da. How many times have you beaten people over the head with Scripture? Okay, what spirit were you of at that time? Did you have to have the last word? Did you have to be right? Um, was it pride? You know, think about it. When you beat people over the head with Scripture, why are you doing that? Right? What spirit is in control at that moment? Jesus had a similar problem at one time with his disciples. Now, I want you to think about this. What tree are his disciples Luke nine fifty one through 56 And it came to pass, when the time was come that he should be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers before his face, and they went, and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. And they did not receive him, because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. And when his disciples James and John, this is James and John, okay, and when his disciples James and John saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them even as Elias did? Okay. But he turned and rebuked them. This is what Jesus did. He rebuked them and said, Ye know not what manner of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. You know, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. The Son of Man won't do that. So here we have the fact that Jesus' own disciples, who spent lots of time with him, not just one 30-minute sermon a week, but they spent daily time, night time with him. They had murder in their hearts. They wanted to kill people that disagreed with him. Now, they used scripture. They had a scriptural precedent, just like the just like the Pharisees did when they wanted to kill Jesus by healing on the Sabbath. They had a scriptural precedent to kill. They had a scriptural precedent to do what Elijah did. If Elijah did it, it must be okay. So, they wanted to kill people in the name of Jesus. They, the disciples that were with Jesus daily and nightly and in the Mount of Transfiguration, all these miracles, they wanted to kill people <laughs> in the name of Jesus because they disagreed with him. Jesus pointed out they didn't know what spirit they were of. Now, this is one thing Pastor Rick was talking about recently, the discipline of not having the last word. Now, we're talking about pursuing Jesus, but I'm building a case to get there. This might be a two or three part series. But the discipline of not having the last word. I'm going to readdress a scripture that we go over a few times. I'm going to take a different look at it after this. Hi, this is Moniz from KeeperOfGodsWord.blogspot.com. And you're listening to Coffee with Conrad on ConradRocks.net. Thank you for visiting ConradRocks.net. Conrad Rocks is supported by people just like you. If you've been blessed by Conrad Rocks, please prayerfully consider giving an offering. 
You can conveniently do so by using the Contribute button on the sidebar at conradrocks.net. Regular contributors get a spot on the Conrad's Comrades page, which links back to the blog or social media of your choice. You can also help Conrad Rocks by sharing your favorite posts on Facebook. Thanks again for being a part of Conrad Rocks. Remember, Jesus rules. That is higher than going to be talking a little bit about 1 Peter 3.15, and I know that I'm, I I mention this verse a lot, but just as the seraphim fly around the throne of God, you know, God breathes things into existence, and um, no man gets to the Father but by me. That's the Word. Do you realize that? So when we look at the Word, and we, we have access to the Father through the Word, I'm just blown away by the different ripples of revelation. That's Conrad Rocks, Rocks of Revelation. I'm blown away by the fresh new revelation of the same words. And the seraphim are flying around God. And they're going, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. They do it because they're commanded to, but they also do it because they're blown away by the new revelation. In First Peter 3.15, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. And be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that's in you with meekness and fear. Ponder on that. That's one that's one I think that people should memorize. Now I talk about this scripture a lot. I've dealt recently about the heart and heart solutions. I suggest you get that three part series. Talks about the heart progression. Of a Christian. But notice here, there's hope in this verse. People will ask you a reason of the hope that's in you. This hope radiates a beam. It's it, it radiates off, or they wouldn't ask. I mean, imagine this. For someone to ask you this question, they must see that you're bearing the fruit of hope. You're looking up because your redemption is drawing nigh. The Christ that dwells in us gives us hope. Notice that hope, it's almost like a a fruit of the Spirit. It isn't really mentioned directly, but hope is uh, a, a spiritual byproduct of Christ. Let's look at the flesh fruits. You know, think of the, uh, the disciples of Christ. What, what spirit were they of? Right, we're looking at fruit of the spirit. They were wanting to kill people that disagreed with them in the name of Jesus, right? <laughs> so let's let's think of that, and and don't think you know this. When we answer with meekness is in fear, it's because even though we spend time with Christ, we might get it wrong from time to time. Like Peter said, "Far be it from you, Lord, to be crucified." My gosh, you know I love you. I don't want that to happen to you. And then he calls him Satan, right? So. Humility. It's a hallmark of the Christian faith. We need to walk in humility. But here we go. I'm going to look at the this hope thing. We're parking that. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready to always give an answer for every man that asks you the reason of the hope that's in you. Let's park that in our spirit. And let's, let's remember what James and John were saying. And then let's move in to the fruits of the flesh and the fruits of the spirit. Galatians 5.19, now the works of the flesh are manifest. This is their fruit, okay? Which of these adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. 
know, they were wanting to murder in the name of Jesus. Of which I tell you before, I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, and faith. Faith's kind of like hope, isn't it? Faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. Meekness, temperance, against their against such there is no law. And they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. Now we see that hope is not a byproduct of a fleshly fruit. But it's a byproduct, and you know, it's tied closely together with faith. So, working backwards, we can see that the Jews were killing Christians, and the Muslims are killing Christians. They do not exemplify what Galatians would call the fruits of the Spirit. They hold their texts very dear, right? But they're not bearing the fruit. Of the Spirit. They're not moving towards the way of Jesus Christ in hope. They're trying to move away from hell. They're trying to seek approval from men, but they're moving away from hell in fear. Moving away from hell is not moving directly towards the way of Jesus. The fruit of proactively killing Christians is not a spiritual fruit. It's a selfish fruit. So now, about pursuing God. One of the things that I wanted to establish is that we're working in the right spirit. I've noticed that most of the conversations in social media, and I see this often, I mean, that's huge. Matter of fact, it's insanely huge. I mean, you're going to go, yeah, Conrad's right about this. Most of the conversations in social media and when in the western you know the america europe and all that is about having this last word it's about being right you want to call down fire from heaven and destroy the person on the other end of that keyboard for disagreeing with you you want to kill him in jesus name right we're wanting to shove our theology down the throats of people that disagree with us Right? That's what it's it's like so what spirit are we of? Are we destroying or are we unifying like Jesus said? I'm not come to to kill, steal, or destroy. That's Satan's job. I'm not here to destroy men's lives. I'm here to save it. Father God, I pray that we're one. Father God, I pray that they people will know they're my disciples by the love they have one for another. Doesn't that sound more like Jesus? Do we really have to have the last word? So, in this somewhat of a science of pursuing God, the one of the things that you know I began saying that we need to take it upon ourselves to study the Bible, to read, and to pursue God. But what's our motivation? And that's what I wanted to deal with here, is we need to identify the fruits of the Spirit that causes us to pursue God. Are we doing it because our pastor told us? Are we doing it because we want to have the better theology on the Internet so we can call down fire from holy heaven and destroy the person on the other end of that keyboard? Are we doing it so we can look good on Facebook and say, you know, I got I know more scripture than you do, right? Or Why are we doing it? That's basically pride. Right? We don't want to do it because of pride. We want to do it from a different spirit, a spirit of seeking God with sincerity. Right? We're going to talk about that in part two um, a little bit more. So thank you for being a part of Conrad Rock. Stay tuned for the next part in this series of Pursuing God. God bless you. And till we meet again, dig deeper, go higher. Thank you.